So I guess to get started kind of on the topic of the Alexandra interview, um, did y'all notice that uh, when we held that event, I think we got a little bit of attention and there was like a ton of influx of users. Like I think over the course of like a couple of days, we went from like 14 to 20 like weekly active users to like 400 something. And I think a lot of the more kind of of the more like spammy variety um, kind of creating content that, you know, isn't necessarily like obviously bad, but um, would probably turn off um, like very serious scientific researchers who would want to attract to the site as new users. So I guess um, just to get started, it would be awesome to hear, uh, like if you guys noticed that as well, sort of what you, what I guess associations it brings up in your mind, like kind of like how it makes you feel emotionally as like, you know, one of our target users. And then after kind of hear that out, I'd want to talk about um, some of the strategies we've mentioned internally of how we can uh, maybe try and make this a little bit better. I don't know about you guys, but for me, it's a little, I know it's in, in a way it's irrational, but it's a little discouraging and demotivating to post your own comments, you know, like, because, you know, in the eyes of the general public, like if you're an active user of a uh, research hub, and then the appearance of research hub is like a place where people post spammy, like meaningless comments, Right, that creates this little bit of you know shame maybe to you know po post things in you know from your own persona, so to say. Does it make sense? Yeah, so to repeat back, it's like this. You know, there's a lot of low quality comments here. If I post two, then I'm also a low quality comment, kind of. It kind of. Yeah, I do understand. Like, and but like. I thought it was nice that, uh, like, when you guys do organize these kinds of events, like, Research Hub gets noticed. So, I agree, like, with all the spam and stuff, it's really, uh, I uh, dislike it as well. But I guess it's kind of the way forward, maybe, in attracting people, uh, like, uh, we've suggested before, like, organizing events or maybe webinars or other kinds of talks. Because, like, with all the other methods we're employing right now, we never see that kind of influx of users. Yeah, thank you, Philip. I agree. I mean, I, I think in general it's cool to be associated with people who are, like, doing, you know, awesome stuff in the space in real time. So I 100% I agree with that. And if there's anybody specifically that you would want to see us chat with, um just let me know and we can like try and make that happen because even this event was mostly like anton being like hey you know we're kind of connected to alexandra like should we do an event and i was like yeah definitely and then you know we made it happen so like if anybody you know wants to see more stuff like that like we can definitely collaborate and try and you know bring more attention um yeah th thank you for mentioning that and i agree that it, it probably is worth like the pros and the cons the extra exposure is probably worth a little bit of like you know, a stress test of spam coming to the platform. Yeah. You know, it would be cool if you uh, if you bring over Brian Nozick. Yeah, I think we definitely could do that. Yeah. I think, Philip, that, that's a good point, too, because, I mean, even when, like, when we were all in high school or middle school, remember how the teachers were all like, hey, don't use Wikipedia as a source, you know, because it's not legit. Now, like, sentiment has shifted and wikipedia is a great place to do initial starter you know like knowledge and like yeah just get get the content so yeah i think in the beginning you do get a lot of especially on an open platform like this you do get a lot of people who kind of get low quality but hope is over time like that'll shift so yeah and like the the low quality right now was maybe even slightly higher quality like sometimes the the comment was still like yeah maybe you can see something in them and before was just like some random words next to each other 
I wonder, Pat, if our uh, if our SIFT is doing a better job at filtering out like the super low quality ones, or if we're I definitely just... think it is. I mean, you might see all the emails we get. We get a lot of people emailing us like, "Hey, why is our account banned?" And we we get, I think we have more than before. So, yeah, I, I've definitely noticed that too. Does anyone else have any thoughts on kind of like overall feeling of this before we move on to potential options? Yeah, I mean, it was uh, hopeful but discouraging at the same time. Like, spam is always going to exist. Uh, like, if you see YouTube or Twitter, it's still there. But um, I think it's it's good to like. You're probably going to talk about this to start thinking of like the mechanisms to uh, to put down that spam uh, early. So uh, at the same time, if I had joined a uh, research hub at, at, at that specific point where everything was spamming. I'm not sure I would have uh, reached out. I would have probably dismissed it. So it, it's like a fine line between um, between like growing users and uh, but also uh, curving spam, spam. Yeah, you only get one first impression. So, so yeah, I guess. Um, the options that we have so far are we've tried an ML filter and it's had moderate success, but it's clearly not doing the total job. And so apparently what a lot of companies will do is like build out their own custom solution. So we're not quite there yet. Like <laughs> There's a lot of things we need to build before we do that. And so um, that's probably something significantly down the line. And so um, one thing we've considered is potentially hiring somebody to just be like a full-time moderator and just like uh, like Hacker News, I don't know if you've ever seen this forum, but um, they have like, I think two or three users who it's like their day job to actually always be on there and like deleting comments that are inappropriate, stuff like that. And so I think we could do this because there are um, people who have done this in the past, you know, and do it like as a profession for like pretty cheap because they're, you know, outsourced overseas. And so um, the advantages of this would be having someone always patrolling the forum and rather than having to rely on kind of like our efforts, like when we happen to be there, like trying to delete spam, there would be someone who's like always there deleting spam. Um, so that would be good. And in theory, we would reduce the time where spam was there. So that way when Nick visited, you'd be like, oh, this is cool. You know, I don't, you know, see any spam. Um, but then the downsides of that is, you know, we'd have to pay that person. <laughs> so not always ideal. But uh, yeah, curious what you guys think about that. And maybe if any other uh, ideas pop into your head and how we could potentially curb it. Like, uh... I really like the idea of like not having to bother every time, like, and maybe just uh, having one person set to do it. But like, I think if we get like some kind of spam attack, I think it would be nice for that person to have like an on off switch for the, um, the notifications on the live feed. Like sometimes it's nice to see, okay, something was removed, but if there's really like a spam attack, I don't want to see like a whole live feed with everything removed. So that if that person removes something and it's like a spam attack, it just like, uh, yeah, presses a button. And then if he removes, it's not shown in the live feed anymore. Yeah, we're working on something for this now. Um, okay, yeah. yeah. So do you like seeing that? Like, oh, this thing was removed. Like sometimes if it's like one out of 10 or something. Yeah, that generally I, I don't really like it, but some people in the past did, I guess. Yeah, we're working on removing that whole piece of it, so like yeah. we don't we don't show it basically. Because yeah, if there's like ten items removed out of like fifteen, then like it looks weird. Mm -hmm. Have you considered uh, completely reverting the paradigm? With, you wouldn't delete comments that you don't like, but maybe comments that you know new users post they are invisible to everyone else for for at least a short while before they are sorted somehow uh you, you know the what, what it creates is a situation where 
like some people are not you know spammers they just they get on the platform they don't maybe they don't really know english or something they, they got the gist they want to participate their participation is not the most beautiful thing to witness but you can still use them as you know lurkers basically so they can still post comments they will be is it is it partially visible to other users or invisible at all unless they have been you know their comments have been upvoted by regulars or power users or the moderators something like that i mean i think we've thought about that a little bit it's i think it's hard because especially if we don't have somebody who's doing this full time you know and like going through every single piece of content like i think it's tough until that if unless that happens then like yeah it's gonna be because even if we put a time filter on it and like we just rely on you know like us as a group doing that i think a lot of stuff will still slip through so yeah yeah i think uh some of the other things we can do are there are like specific content moderation subscriptions but those are also of like you know moderate efficacy and um are pretty expensive so yeah it's kind of a, a crappy problem where in order to really fix it we need like a bunch of engineers <laughs> but we might be able to um you know uh do something short term so i guess the the next thing i wanted to talk about was um we've been working with that uh volunteer uh salesperson who has been reaching out to like academic chairs and stuff like that in order to help uh try and get new really high quality users one thing um, they wanted to give a shot at was trying to set up partnerships with other like um, established companies where we could in theory help like get research up more exposure one example of this is kind of what we're thinking about with osf where like if somebody posted a preprint they'd be like oh hey yeah let me click the box to have this posted on research hub and then i'll earn some tokens or something so um, Andrew asked for a list of potential companies that we could integrate with. And I have some thoughts of my own, but I figured I'd throw it to you guys to see like if there was anything um, that you thought that Research Hub could plug into in order to like help provide value for users of another service. I don't know if it's like a really feasible idea, but I kind of like the like the because I'm involved in biotech and stuff in a lab, like a biotech related company that maybe somehow relates to research hub. Like maybe it's too commercial in the end, but still like like some kind of DNA service, uh, DNA oligo producing service, and then. I don't know how we would link it to research, of course, but um, I think that, that then you really attract a different kind of people, um, and that might have an influx of academic um, academic uh, people as well. But on the other hand, like uh, people from industry. Yeah, I wonder if down the road we could do something where people earned free research coin when they bought their, you know, all goes with a certain company. They, they could be like, hey, here's, you know, five bucks, claim it if you want by downloading this theory mod or something. Um, so another example that um, this somebody had actually offered this in the past was kind of like a multi-level marketing like um, herb company where in theory this like pill would help like reduce your immune response to stuff and it had all this like positive benefits where you'd be beautiful and be young forever because of it and so um this company wanted to work with us to essentially like have discussion of these articles that they were producing because they were doing their own clinical trials or whatever where it was like oh like you know a c -re reactive peptide goes down when you take these pills so you have less inflammation and stuff like that so I do think there's potential for us to like work with people who have commercial interest in getting more attention to their papers. Um, so that that was just another thought of like, hey, how do we get more content generation going? But yeah, so so that's just an example. But curious what you think of that, or if there are other you know kind of examples that pop up.
Have you considered uh, working with the bibliography editors like Zotero, Mendeley? Because they are one step away from being fully integratable with you. Like, think about it this way. People use it to st save interesting articles and to save their own comments on it. That's like one click away from if it, if it props you, if it asks you, hey, this article, you know, you've spent some time reading it and looked interesting to you or something, and you have made a comment for yourself. Would you like to make this comment public? And then if yes, it just create automatically creates the entry for the paper and posts a comment that they have. I think that's a great idea. Um, one thing we've even talked about recently in the team is potentially building out uh, or working with another company that does this like citation management. Because I agree, like some of the, the social features of like, oh, hey, I'd love to know like what's Nami been reading the past couple months? You know, what's he been interested in? I think would be really cool. Um, that's a great suggestion. I think we could definitely do something like that. This and, is kind uh, of too good. Oh, sorry. Yeah, right. sorry, no. No, no, no. Right. <laughs> Do you want with it? <laughs> okay, uh, so this is a curveball, but uh, have you tried like uh, collaborating with Pablo? Thought about like collaborating service with Pablo's, who are kind of like reviewer aggregators, so reviewers for journals. And we have been talking about incentivizing authors and getting them on board. But what about the reviewers that review the papers that are on there? Like, uh, is there any way? This is not a well formed idea, but is there any way to get those reviewers in the platform and talk about the papers that they review, for example? Oh, okay. So you're saying like uh, actually maybe share their reviews that they've done in the past for other papers to that, that's interesting. One thing I'm not aware of is who owns the legal copyrights to a peer review? Like do journals own like can can peer reviewers distribute their own copies of peer review or are they like silenced by the journal? I've never looked into that before. It's interesting. I think it's up to the reviewers who maybe they have a uh, copyright uh, transfer agreement or not. But I've never heard reviewers signing copyright transfer agreement to the journal. So maybe the copyright still rests on the reviewers, but I'm not sure. Yeah, no, that's a great point. Um, yeah, I think we should definitely, I, I think we're going to build some kind of attempt to tackle peer review at some point. And so when we have that, I think it would make a ton of sense. Uh, Dragon, what'd you say? Automatic rewards driven by all metrics, focus on rewarding, not the distribution. Okay, so this would be like kind of what we did with trying to um, see Twitter data and then rewarding posts based on like their Twitter activity. Yeah, something like that, for example. Uh, sorry, my internet connection is bad today. Uh, yeah, but like just having a different kind of focus and yeah, it would be similar to Twitter and uh, like similar uh, you know, actions. Uh, but yeah, it comes with definitely uh, problems of its own kind. So yeah. <laughs> so the one cool thing about Altmetric is they are an Elsevier company. And that means they're integrated with Mendeley. So they have like Mendeley data sometimes in like Altmetric, like how many people have saved this article. So we spoke with them uh, maybe like nine months ago to potentially just use their tool rather than building our own like Twitter um, like feature. And they wanted, I don't remember what it was, Pat, but it was like near forty, fifty thousand dollars a year to use Altmetric. And uh, at the time we figured it was just probably better to do our own thing. But yeah, they're 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 pretty expensive. So we'd have to like come up with sort of our own custom solution to to do some of this stuff. Yeah, I wasn't aware of that. So yeah, <laughs> then it's a bad choice. I know it's frustrating because it could be pretty cool, but you know, it is what it is. Okay, cool. So I think this is a pretty good list to send over. Does anybody like have any other shots in the dark? Um, one that I was thinking of was uh, my girlfriend did like a 23andMe type like DNA thing and they sent her a report where it's like, oh, here's all your thing, you know, like nucleotide polymorphisms or whatever. 
and there would be citations with papers explaining how that resulted in some kind of like, oh, like you're more likely to be allergic to gluten or something like that. And there would be a citation with a paper. And so I was thinking like, it might be pretty cool to somehow get like people who are interested in their health, you know, interested in this research, like paying money for some kind of service to have those citations be linked to research hub papers where there's actual discussion going on, where then somebody with a gluten allergy could be like, oh, you know, I had, I've had this experience, kind of like the one paper that we had where it was like mast cell, um, you know, syndrome for COVID-19. There were a lot of like actual patients who were like commenting on it and sharing their experiences. So that, that was another idea. It was like the 23andMe type genetic data service to try and like talk to the authors that they've cited and get an open discussion going with patients. Um, so yeah, maybe somewhat continued on that point, but what if a uh, research hub isn't uh, like a product first company, but a service first company, for example, that you're offering uh, tools that other companies can use to build their own kind of economy. And basically they just use you to drive uh, like everything technology wise. Uh, so, for example, I know if Archive, OSF, or whoever wants to integrate uh, Research Hub, they some, have some builder tools and they just build the mechanics that they want for their website and then just like use you as a service provider. I'm not sure if this made sense. So, it kind of reminds me of um, Steemit. Like maybe three or four years ago, they made like a social token that could be plugged into any web app that in, I forget what they called it. It was like the universal social token or something. But um, they they basically tried to be like, if any forum wanted to plug into blockchain rewards, like you could do it easily. Um, I, I could see that happening, but I think uh, it would be like 15 years in the future once everybody who runs like archive and bioarchive and some of these like big scientific uh, institutions are uh, more familiar with tokens and comfortable with like having value being exchanged through them. Fair enough, definitely. Cool. Um, so yeah, does anybody have any other ideas? We've got like five minutes left before, and I want to go over the results from last week. I was just thinking it would be cool if like we could somehow get like archive or bioarchive yeah some of these to like use us maybe as like a, a comment site or like a commenting platform where if you have a if they have a paper on their site they can like click to find the mirror on research hub with like discussion on it um i think uh osf they have like their their own infrastructure that lets people create like their own archives like they have uh sci archive so so archive and all of these are like under the osf infrastructure so since we're already kind of in talks with them, maybe we could try and get something like this going. And then maybe hopefully that could eventually snowball into like the really big archives like BioArchive and regular archive would be pretty cool, I think. But yeah. It's an awesome point. Um, one thing that when I had coffee with Ryan Nesik, he kind of floated to me as an idea would be like a preprint server where every preprint that was posted, it was earning tokens. Um, and that way, in theory, his issue and preprint servers in general, I've seen this, they just don't have a revenue model, so they can't pay for the server costs to host everything. And so I've seen even like Law Archive went out of service because like they can't afford the server costs. And so one thing we could do is just help them afford server costs, like help basically like um, supplement their server costs with RSC because they're sharing things, you know, openly. So I think there's absolutely something there where it could be like branded and extended, um, you know, two different fields uh, that also wanted to have cheaper preprint servers. Yeah, like if we sort of experiment with uh, the, the smaller archives that run under OSF and it like uh, shows that it's working and it's helping them generate revenue and keep the lights on, then maybe like the bigger servers would be interested as well. Yeah, it's an interesting idea. That's definitely, we could totally explore that. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, so for last week, uh, Anton had a million comments. Again, I think I think it was something like 10 posts and 10 comments. And then uh, Nick had five and five. So um, 
I think this is going pretty well so far. And um, unfortunately, we're sort of stuck in a holding pattern because we're waiting for RSC to be listed before like we can really totally scale this up big time. But uh, an idea that I just had um, talking to Pat before this and uh, like Anton and Nicholas, this isn't necessarily uh, like saying we'd like want you guys to do this if you wanted to, cool. But like we could, I think, find people who would be interested in helping us out here. But um, the uh, Andrew, the salesperson, he's essentially like reaching out on our behalf to uh, like people would be really high value users and worthwhile to the community. So um, I was thinking one thing that we could potentially do is try and use RSC as an incentive for people to reach out to these super high quality users that would then increase the value of the network in general. And so Pat and I were talking about maybe some kind of referral program where once we have the claim paper feature ready to go, um, I could in theory find like a paper on meditation I think is really interesting. And I would ask a question and earn research coin if I on my own emailed a professor with that question and said, hey, I want you to answer this in the public. So that way there's a public exchange, you know, people can, I'm sure I'm not the only one with this question, like other people will want to see it. Um, and then have some kind of unique referral link where if the professor clicked through and then signed up and answered the question, the person who asked it and emailed would get some kind of reward. The kind of variation on this is not having a question be part of it and just have like an automatic type of uh, workflow where people could invite authors to claim their papers. Yeah, I, I think that would that would be useful. I think it's a good idea. Uh, I, I myself wondered uh, what if I uh, invite someone to claim their paper that I'm uploading. So uh, I like the idea. Pat, I even think like what Nick said just made me think maybe on the upload flow, we could even have like a prompt to be like, hey, do you want the author to claim this? Here's their email, you know, and it could take you to Outlook, you know, with some suggested copy or something. Yeah, we don't, the thing is we don't always get their email. So like we would need to rely on other people having their email too, inputting it in. So. Yeah. So that, that's kind of different than like the incentive side of thing. It's still an incentive, but less so uh, pertaining to the content. Um, how do you guys feel so far with the reward scheme? Do you think we should change anything or try something out or something else out just to um, see what happens? It's hard to say because we don't know what's the value of RSC, right? Yeah, yeah, totally. It's, uh, yeah, we're kind of, a transitory phase where I think it makes sense to be a little more conservative. Are you are you looking for more people to be part of the power user program? Because it's kind of not accessible to be honest. Like I don't think I would have found an opportunity like that if I were a new user, you know. Yeah, I think I think it makes sense to keep it to people who are more interested in making research up better than they are in earning research coin, if that makes sense. You know, like the motivation is actually to improve. So that's, it's a little bit more difficult to find because you have to have people, you know, who are like emotionally invested in the project. So I think, I think I could start to reach out to more people. I've had a ton on my plate, so I didn't do this last week, but I think we could expand this to like 10 people or so. But um, yeah, I guess, do you guys think that'd be worthwhile? I can try and do that. Yeah, I think it will look better because right now it could, I think it can be a little jarring for new users if they go to the live feed and they see like two, three people posting million things and they're like, oh, this, oh, this is a one person forum. I see, I see. Okay, <laughs> I'll just move along. Nothing to see here. Yeah, no, I, I totally agree. Um, one thing I did earlier today, um, just for like context sake, is I went back, we, we had a bunch of users for that Alexandra thing. So I went back and looked at like our monthly active users just to like 
have a total scale of it. And I'll share the screen here just so you guys can see. But um, I, I think it's one of those things where a really long time ago, it was just me posting. You know what I mean? And it was like pretty weird because it was just me all the time. And um, now it's like a lot more than just me. And I imagine like three months from now, it will be a lot more than just, you know, the core group here that are um, filling up the live feed. So, so this is uh, the past, I think like six months, which is the end of the research coin giveaway. And then um, kind of in between during the spring and these are the past three months. So I think we're, we're headed at, at least in a decent direction. And kind of, as I said, that it's like, you know, semi awkward now with just like a couple of people on the live feed, but I, I think in three or six months, it's gonna have a lot more uh, variety up there. So yeah, I guess that's pretty much all I had. Do you all have anything else um, for us to speak to folks on? Have you figured out why the abstract editing is weird? Yes, definitely. Um, Thomas, Pat, do you guys have that on the bug list? Yeah, it's on the list of things, yeah. Yeah, and a small remark, like when a post gets removed, it still pops up in my live feed as it, it wasn't removed. So is it for all users like this or just for more? Yeah, it, it, I think it's right now it's taking a little bit of time to get it removed. So it just, okay. yeah, yeah, it yeah, needs yeah. to get it removed immediately, yeah. I've noticed that too, yeah. Philip. Sometimes like that comment live feed, it'll hang around a little bit longer too. Yeah, okay. And like, I would like, I know um, Brian has been kind of against this as you like talked us through uh, like um, before, but like I would love to see like a really specific event, like because right now we like gain the traction because of the interview with Alexandra and stuff and with the bio archive, that would be nice, but sometimes it would also be nice to just have like a niche of people joining just to get like multiple people um, maybe on one subject joining and then getting more attraction because like now sometimes we get some people but then in the end it fades away because we don't have an upcoming event anymore and sometimes I've got the feeling like ah there's, and then I think ah there's going to be like tons of new users and then it's again Anton and Nicholas, <laughs> um, like with a bu with a bunch of comments, uh, which is nice, of course. But like, and it's like ah, uh, okay. So I guess like just organizing some like specific um, events would be really nice, in in my opinion. So, so you you. You would want like want it to be maybe monthly, like every month, just an interview with, you know, some relatively popular person. Yeah, 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 yeah. Like, like for me, how I got to a researcher was with uh, Tristan Roberts with a mini circle DNA in the beginning. That would, and then I got to know about research and everything. But like, otherwise, I would have never known about it. Of course, I know Brian likes it more. Like. Uh, research have research uh, having value itself, but still like. Yeah, yeah, yeah but... thing. and like I, I tend to agree with you. I think events like that and even going back to the Tristan Roberts one, like at the end of the day, we are building a community and th that's the way you build a community is like you kind of put yourself out there and like people see you and then they become familiar with you. And, you know, like you get to the point where we get your help every week. So I, I agree. I think we can definitely try and do something like on a monthly basis, even like not even worried about the users, just as like, a, you know, a fun time to get a bunch of people together for. Um, yeah. I Maybe guess people do you from, think, uh, sorry. Do you think, do, is there any way of knowing, uh, based from the Alexandra's event, do you think a lot of people came over because of the banner on the research hub itself? Or do you think the majority of people came before, because of the external ads? We have those numbers. I think I can put up right now, but I think it was like a third of the people came from research hub. Um, 
yeah, let me pull this up. I can show you right here. One second. Yeah, so I'm not sure what direct counts as. That's like people went right to the uh, URL in their browser. Um, but normally that can happen sometimes coming from Reddit just based on the browsers that people use. So Reddit was decent. I posted in um, our open science and our Sci-Hub. Uh, this is from our like banner browser from just pretty much like the 24 hours before. Um, so 36 came from there. And then uh, Twitter and old Reddit is just a, another version for Reddit. But yeah, so this is where people came from. OK, so it might be a decent idea. Even even if you don't want to spend your budget you know, advertising, if you have monthly events and only post announcement on the Research Hub itself, it's still going to be like an OK measure to bolster the community to create more sense of belongingness, maybe. Yeah, totally. And it might be something like once we have more funding, we could hire someone specifically to like organize community and like plan these events and get people excited for them. Um, but it's at, at this point, you know, it's tough because there's a lot of points to keep in the air. But even this Alexandra event, it was great because, you know, Anton like did a lot of the work, a lot of the legwork. So it, it was easy for us to kind of like put it together and advertise it and kind of leverage some of the things that we have. But um, yeah, I do think eventually having, you know, it's just like any field in science, like having conferences is fun. <laughs> you get to see your friends and like learn about new stuff. So I think, I think we should definitely try and like sponsor the community aspect of that part of science. Ooh, hey, that actually, okay. I think you stumbled upon a gem of an idea. You could, you could present yourself as a service that's more targeting the starting like the, the beginning researchers or like new researchers or whatever who need you know who, who need to gain some traction right so you could or maybe organize a a student conference or something mm -hmm. kind of like virtual and uh, have the you know prizes or something it doesn't matter if it's rsc or uh, dollars or whatever just something small and memorable something and and that what what's great is if you specifically target the you know the start and the young researchers they're not they're not famous yet right so it will be easier to convince them to you know it's not a waste of your time and you know posters or short talks are not are not a lot of commitment and if it's virtual maybe in gather town or something that would be fun I think that's a genius idea. I think, you know, I remember when I was an undergrad, like I did a poster session for my research and like nobody ever saw it, <laughs> that thing's long gone. And so I think I think that people could definitely like put up the PDF of their posters. It kind of makes our new post feature work well and it would get attention from like pretty much our target user base. So that's, that's a really good idea. Um, I'll think about that a little bit more and maybe touch base with you, Anton, because I think we could definitely do something there where there was some kind of contest that like the, the most upvoted paper or something, you know, um, we had like some cool scientists watch their presentation and like give them feedback and stuff, something like that. Mm -hmm. I think the, the events thing uh, has potential to like, it doesn't really need to be that big of an event or that famous of a speaker. You could just meet with uh, a department at a university and talk to their non-tenured uh, faculty uh, to have an incentive to publish. Can you, can you repeat that back for me one more time? So talking to the non-tenured faculty to um, like give them attention to their publications, like having them be right, speakers? So they may have publications, like I know a ton of uh, people are just teaching courses. They may have the research that they'll publish someday when they reach uh, a certain status, but it's just sitting there. If they were to publish or even uh, short posts on Research Hub, uh, I think that would be useful. And there's a ton of people like that uh, in basically every single department, especially in like 
I, I don't really like this word, but like second tier universities or like mm -hmm. state universities um, where they may not have the budget for research, but um, they still have research ideas. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I, I all absolutely agree. I think it's a brilliant pathway for research hubs, kind of like you're betting on a little bit of underdogs, you know, like it not, people who have research, but they maybe maybe the results are not as, you know, not as enticing and they hoped and they now feel, you know, unmotivated to write an entire manuscript about it. But they might be convinced to make a short poster or a short talk about it instead, right? So that's a way to kind of like scavenge or recycle, recycle your content that you have, but it's not, it's not in the right state for for a publication, right? And there is a lot of stuff like that. Like everyone, everyone in academia has a desk full of stuff that never saw a light of day, and some of it has a lot of promise. It's just not quite there yet. Okay, so you'd be thinking about like um, hosting some kind of event for like uh, professors to be able to talk about their research or whatever they're working on in their lab at the time, accompanied by a post of describing it. Yeah, kind of like no low, low stakes type of thing. Like yeah, it's like it would be a place to talk about some of the data you have and but it's it's not enough to make a definitive conclusion but you would like to speculate and talk about it with uh, other people and you know full transparency yes it's a speculation but you still want to discuss it right otherwise it's just sitting in your desk so maybe stuff like that more like an you know, experimental <laughs> not ex experimental in 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 a non scientific term you know yeah, I'm thinking back to um, a few months ago, I would go through our science and pick like the top papers of the month and then email their authors and ask if they want to do a live AMA. And we had like a pretty good response rate. Like it was like one out of 10 would be like, yeah, sure. You know, I'll, I'll speak for an hour on this paper. And so um, it just, it ends up being a lot of legwork. But at the time I was like, man, it'd be pretty cool if like anybody who is doing a journal club like also reached out to the author of the paper and was like, hey, we're doing a journal club. Like, do you want to record it and like answer some questions and then like we'll post it. Um, but yeah, I do think eventually we could hire people to like host these types of events and like, you know, get some conversation uh, like going around those things. But yeah, I think right. people can talk about their stuff for sure. Because think about it, right now we have this uh, problem that people like esteemed people don't come over, right? Because they're very cautious about how about the reputation and their their time, their free time. So they, they need to be convinced that the research hub is not you know waste of their time and their reputation. So if you if you go with the Nicholas route or the student conference route, you think about it, right? If if you are a PI in a lab and just one of your students you know, ask you like, hey, is it okay if I post our, you know, recent data set as, as you know, a part of this conference? Now they have a legit reason to come over and check it out. Like, what is this thing? Research Hub It's you know, hosting conferences. I think students or what Nicholas said, the people who are maybe adjuncts or they are on teaching track, right? So they, they still have stuff to present, maybe not as much stuff. Right. Yeah, totally. And that could definitely be pretty cool. Okay, so so just to kind of repeat back to make sure um, that we're understanding, you guys like the events and you know want more of them kind of regularly, like maybe once a month, and then maybe we could use some of these events as like tools to recruit, you know, specifically the users that we'd want to see be commenting on research help. Okay, cool. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate uh, the extra time to chat about that too, because I agree. I think I think the events are a cool thing and helps give us a little bit of personality too. So, um, great. I guess uh, does anybody have anything else? Just a small one, and then we can round up. Yeah, um, no, yeah, for sure. I'd love to get in touch, like, or maybe like uh, an AMA with the people from the Alpha Fold. Like Nicholas was great sharing, like the I didn't know. 
So uh, I've really been like um, spamming a lot of people in my lab with uh, this. I think it's really great. And if we could do like an AMA or like an event with these people, okay, it's not like the student uh, idea and or the, the, the low key PI idea, but still, I think it would really be great. My so there you go. That's our next event, right? Um, I think Gazir had posted that in the community Slack. So Philip, if you want to say, hey, you know, we should talk, this paper's amazing. I'm sharing it with everybody. Like, we should do an event with these guys. Like, I can follow up and say, yeah, let's do it. You know, Gazir, like, let me know. I'll get on a phone call with him. We can set it up. Make it happen. Okay. Yeah, great. That's a very good last small thing, Philip. That's awesome. Thank you. Anybody else? We good? Cool. Well, thanks again, everybody. Um, yeah, glad for all the extra time and feedback. We'll see you next week. See ya.